Now on the APEC VIP hotline, cutting edge training for the serious athlete, apecgo.com. Joining us now from the Fort Worth Star Telegram, the author of the Big Mac blog, it's Mac Engel. How you doing, Mac? I'm pretty good, Brian. What's going on? Well, I, I got to ask you before we get to the misery, disaster, and uh, despair of the Cowboys game yesterday. I have to ask you about your activities on Friday. I understand you rappelled down a skyscraper. Is that what you did? Well, it's Fort Worth version of a skyscraper. <laughs> I mean, uh, Texas doesn't have a lot of them. I guess there's a number of them in Houston and a handful in Dallas. But yeah, it's a it's kind of a neat thing. Uh, a nonprofit called. Uh, DFW Inc., which is a nonprofit that wear, raises awareness about downtown Fort Worth, uh, held an event for the second year in a row where people could buy repelling trips down tall buildings in downtown Fort Worth. And a lot of sponsors, a lot of the, a lot of companies did it, a lot of businesses did it as a sponsorship deal and, and as a write off, basically a charity write off. And a handful of members of the media were asked to partake in it. And I had done it last year in a building in downtown Fort Worth. Um, which I had never done before, and, uh, you know, it was a pretty scary experience, to be quite honest. And I, it was a bucket list thing. I always wanted to do something like that. I don't know if I'd ever expressly thought about something, like, specifically like that. So on Friday, they gave us the opportunity to do it again at a different building. This was about 18 or 19 stories. The one I did last year, I think, was 25 or 26. I can't remember exactly. And, yeah, I repelled down the side of a building. I... I I, having de- and people who who uh, who are listening to the show and who have repelled know and understand that once you do it, once you get it out of the way that first time, the rest is pretty easy, and it really was. Did I mean, you once say you so. no, it, it is right. You you wouldn't think that. It's I mean, it, there's it's such an unnatural feeling. Everybody knows the feeling of standing on a tall building. Well, the, the unnatural feeling is standing at the edge of a tall building. Oh my. And then you turn around, even though you're harnessed up and you got ropes on you and you're secure, then you have to lean back. And once you get over that sensation and just how unnatural it is to lean out back and sit down over nothing uh-uh. no. and then start to slowly walk down <laughs> from a reclined position, it's a lot of fun. But I, I would be lying to you if I didn't say halfway down, I was about halfway down, and, I, and it's a neat view. You know, you're way up there, and it is a neat view, and it's very quiet, and you can see everything from a bird's eye view. And it's sort of a surreal experience. Uh, about halfway down, I said, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> I, and I really did. I was like, you know what? i got a wife and a kid. I, I don't need to be doing this stuff. <laughs> and, and at that point, I just wanted to get down. I, I, was, I was starting to lean one way a little bit. I felt a little bit out of whack. And uh, I was like, okay, that, that's cool. I did it. Well, that's neat. I'm done. And I've, you know, I've done, I've parasailed. I've jumped out of a plane. Uh, I've run with the bulls and all that stuff. Seriously? And, and I, yeah, yeah. I've done all that stupid stuff. I, you know, all that thrill-seeking junk. And <laughs> it's fun. I mean, I don't get me wrong. I enjoyed it. But for some reason, yesterday or Friday, rather, when I did it, Brian, I just had this sensation of, and I'm sure as you get older, we all do it. You're like, well, what am I doing? <laughs> When I was young, I was feeling that way. Yeah, I mean, and it's, people can relate to this. I used to, I was playing some pretty competitive pickup basketball games over the summertime against guys who were about 20 years old, and I did it just just as a means of conditioning and get in good shape. But and I know you've, I'm sure you've thought this or had friends who've done this. I thought, you know, what if I get hurt? Yes, yes. And I'm like, I, I don't, I'm not an athlete. If I, if I really get hurt, if I tear up my knee, if I really sprain my ankle, that is going to put a crimp in my life that I, because I think I had, tw- I had landed weird and, you know, kind of twisted my ankle a little bit. And I thought, you know, if, if I really get hurt and I'm on crutches or anything like that, I'm like, I'm not going to be able to take care of my kid. I'm going to be, you know, useless. See, I, I get that stop fe- me from playing or going down the side of a building, but at least I thought about it. I get that feeling when I have to cut my own steak. <laughs> I mean, what are you doing? You need to hire somebody to do this. You're a I fool. Mean, I mean, I could, I could cut a vein and die. You know, so absolutely. You, no, I, well, I respect and, and uh, you know, think you're nuts. But you know, all at the same I, time. But uh, you know, Brian, I, I really appreciate the opportunity. I'm sure, as a member of the media, you get chances to do some things. Yes. Uh, that you wouldn't otherwise. And I'm very grateful for the chance to have you know that off the bucket list, so to speak, and and that is kind of neat. But 
I think I will look for different thrill-seeking adventures that keep me on the ground. Yeah, something a lot lower up. to surface there. That would yeah. be much better right. for you. Well, um, if you really want to thrill-seek, you know, sit through that cowboy game. If that doesn't churn your stomach, I mean, I don't know what would. What was that yesterday? I, you know, I watched, uh, I was just looking this up, and I was, I'm doing it an, uh, every day for your listeners, if they want to partake, go to the Big Mac blog the day after a game, and I'll part, I'm doing a sort of a, a chat with fans on my blog, and, and I, I come up with about five points per game that I look at, and as I rewatch this game, it dawned on me, while it is nauseating to watch this game and just see how badly they play, they, they did, there's, there's no getting around, they played badly, but you know what? I think the only thing that you can take any solace in the fact is the entire league did it. There's After tonight's game between Denver and Atlanta, 22 teams are going to be 500. Wow. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's crazy. Which is 22. exactly what they wanted. Yeah, I mean, if you want parity, that's what you get. So, I, But I think the difference is, is that unlike, for instance, the Patriots are one and one they lost a really bizarre game against the Cardinals at home on Sunday more on Sunday afternoon and you could look at that loss and say wow that's crazy that's totally out of character that 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 probably is not going to happen again but with the Cowboys you look at it and say no that's pretty consistent with who they are we this is probably going to happen again and again and again and that's what drives you nuts there's no faith in the idea that the loss against Seattle was an aberration there's just the historical reality of that says, no, this is what they do. And as long as you do that, until you break that pattern, until you establish the identity that a loss like that is out of character, then there's no reason to believe to think that they're going to go home on Sunday, beat the Buccaneers, and then the next week lay a stinker against the Bears and finish the month 2-2, two and two, which, as you and I both know, is a lead up to eight and eight and uh-huh. get you nowhere. Well, the thing that was more disturbing, I mean, I, granted, the special teams disasters in the first quarter put them in a hole, okay, but they were still in the football game. The thing that's so discouraging about this football game is that in the second half, they got manhandled both on offense and defense, by Seattle. I mean, it was not even a contest. Seattle did whatever they wanted to do in the second half. They imposed their will. It was it was so bizarre because at the end of the first half, you know, they, they were still in it. They're still very much in the game. And it was, you know, you just get one score and the whole world changes. And that first, I guess, seven or eight minutes of the third quarter, it was gone. It was It was, I could not get over how flat they were. And, I, you know, you, you see it on the road a lot. A team gets flat, a long flight, they're just not into it. Something's just not there. You, under, you see it all the time across the NFL. But usually what you see now, because teams are so close, is that they, they at least give themselves a chance to make it interesting. That second half was boring. They were never in that second half. And that's the most bizarre part of that, is that you watch NFL games all the time, and the team that's losing – at least kind of makes it close, at least kind of gives themselves a chance, you know, at least that's what the final score indicates. There was none of that on Sunday in Seattle. They never had a chance in that second half. It was like they, Seattle had the momentum and shoved it down their throats, and the Cowboys, whatever advantage they had against a rookie quarterback making his second start, they were able to take advantage of none of that. I made the comment to uh, David Smoke last hour, and I'll say it again. Now, what you have is next week, based on what we saw at the end of the Giants-Tampa Bay game, where Greg Schiano obviously is trying to uh, establish the Buccaneers as a bit of a bully, uh, you got a team that's going to come into Dallas, and they're going to hit the Cowboys in the mouth. Now, are the Cowboys going to do what they did yesterday, which is curl up in a corner and cry, or are they going to respond with some toughness? And then the following week, they play the Chicago Bears, who are going to hit the Cowboys in the mouth. What are the Cowboys going to do? Based on what you're seeing right now, all this talk about tougher team, that all went out the window yesterday. I, don't, I think you, you, know, you, you mentioned who's going to hit in the mouth. I don't know who on that team is going to do that. Uh, you know, DeMarcus Ware is a phenomenal talent and a great player and you know, maybe a Hall of Fame guy, but he's not the kind of guy who, uh, I, he's not that kind of guy. Sean Lee might be. Josh Brent might be. Jay Radliff definitely is. 
but Jay's not on the field. So you're, I think it's a mentality of who's going to be that guy to stand up to it or impose their will. They don't have the players at the safety position to do it. Barry Church is, Barry Kirk is pretty good at considering where he's come from. I, I think you'd say, yeah, I take that, considering where he was taken and, and such. Jared Sensabaugh is just a guy. Well, and both of those guys may not even be available to play next week. Yeah, yeah, which is a larger issue. So <laughs> I think you just you keep looking at what they have, and you're like, well, I, but again, what they have was good enough to go into New York and beat the Giants, and convincingly. wasn't like that game. wasn't like they squeaked it out. They were the better team against the right. Giants. And then, and then a week later, they just turn around, and they pull this, you know, okay, well, you know, we're not that good. And it was funny this morning. I was driving my three-year-old daughter to school, and on the radio there was a show talking about how the Cowboys ate the cheese. <laughs> and my daughter, as only a three-year-old little girl could say in that wonderful, charming voice, said, I like cheese. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently they do, too. That's exactly right. I was like, well, you're just like the Cowboys. They ate cheese. <laughs> so it was really cute. I wish I could have recorded I it. it. <laughs> yeah, I, I think right now it's... It, you know, it's, you don't really know who the team is. I think you have a better idea who this team is going to be come October. I think the scary part is, is that what you're seeing is a team that looks like the team we've seen for the last couple of years, which is good enough to win and then good enough to go out and, 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 and bad enough to go out and do what they did against Seattle. Well, it was it was pretty bad. Okay, uh, tell people once again who maybe have not heard about DFWOT. Uh, real quick, uh, DFWOT is an uh, iPad only exclusive application. You can find it in the iTunes store for one dollar and ninety nine cents. It is uh, produced by the Fort Worth Star Telegram, and it is exclusively dedicated as an online sports magazine, exclusively dedicated to uh, Dallas Fort Worth area sports, local sports, regional sports, uh, high school, college, pro, Cowboys, in depth stories, um, interactive stuff, audio clips, video clips, um, panoramic shots, great photography. And an online exclusive content, and as well as a uh, exclusive commentary by Randy Galloway, the great Randy Galloway. It's oh available at the iTunes Store for a dollar ninety nine per issue, and it's monthly. Now, when will the next issue come out? Uh, the end of the month. Uh, when, okay. Where are we now, uh, Brian? This is what, September what? the what seventeenth. Seventeenth. So in about two weeks, the new one will hit the uh, stand, so to speak, and you get it on your iPad. That's a really cool app. It, it, I don't know. If, I don't know if you're an iPad user, but it is a cool app, and I think it's the way the business is going, and we're going to see more and more of it. So if you're a fan of DFW area sports and the Big 12, and probably even the SEC now, although I do need to ask you something really quick. Yes. Um, <laughs> the SC, I wanted to ask you about the SEC. Go ahead. And, and you follow LSU. And I do. And you follow all these teams. Is there any team in that league outside of LSU, outside of Alabama, that can really push either one of those teams? It's not looking like it right now. You know, the only team, defensively Florida might be. Um, but what I'm seeing right now is it looks like LSU and Alabama are the class of the West and Florida is the class of the East. And if they get you know some pretty decent quarterback play, their defense is really good. And I think we saw how good it was based on what Johnny Manziel did to SMU last week because he got completely shut down in the second half against Florida. So they look pretty good. After that, I don't know. You know, I think it's just, uh, the, the teams are okay. I don't see anybody being a, a top ten team. Maybe South Carolina. I don't know. It's it's real hard to say. But I, uh, of the, I think LSU and Alabama are far and away the best teams in the conference. No, okay. So that being said, yes. Then the other thing is, who is the best team in Texas right now? You mentioned SMU, the SMU and A&M game where A&M clearly was, you know, light, head and shoulders above. But I, I watched the TCU-Kansas game, the, the first uh, Big 12 game for TCU and Lawrence over the weekend. I went up there for that. Yeah. And I watched a, a decent amount of the Texas Ole Miss game, which I know Texas beat an, an SEC team. But that's, that's a bad worst. SEC team. It's, yeah, that's the worst. That, if it's not the worst team in the SEC team, it, SEC team, it's close. They're real close. So, who would you say is the best team in Texas right now? Wow, man, that's a tough question because nobody's really played anybody yet. Um, if I was going to have to put a, a guess, I guess TCU right now. Uh, You'd say they're better than UT. I don't know how much of UT you've seen. I, I, just, I, I, don't, I don't know about UT because UT has not played anybody yet. I mean, UTEP, no. Uh, New Mexico, no. 
uh, they they proved nothing to me by what they did to Ole Miss because Ole Miss is just not a good football team, uh, and they won't be this year. So they they were two and zero against a couple of dogs that were even worse than some of the teams that Texas played. So I'm not at all impressed or influenced by what happened uh, at, with Ole Miss because that is a team. That, again, they got a brand new head coach. There's a reason for that. They were terrible last year, and you know they're going to have to go a long way to get a lot better. Uh, right now, so I just don't have any confidence that they've played anybody yet. I want to see what they do against a real live football team, and I haven't seen that yet. Well, I know this. After watching TCU play Kansas, and Kansas is bad. Kansas is better than what last season because they've got a real coach and they've got some decent transfers in there, but they're still bad. The one thing that I had wondered about watching TCU play against a Big 12 team, even though, you know, Kansas is bad, is were they big enough? Were they, were they more considerably more talented than Kansas? They are. That they are, they're big enough, they're athletic enough. Gary, Gary's done a good job. They're not, their roster isn't deep enough yet. He's going to have serious issues on that offensive mm-hmm. line when they play real teams. But if they, they have got, they may have the best skilled people in the state right now. Wow. They're, they've got three dynamite receivers, they've got quality running backs, and they've got a quarterback who is as he was more talented than anybody else right now. I mean, he makes some mistakes, but boy, is he talented. So they, I think, after watching that game and thinking about it more, there is a, they, they should be 4-0 after, after this month. They should be Baylor. They should be Texas Tech. And then I'll be very interested to see how they do it in, that, in those last five games when they get the real games. But they, they did answer to me. When I watched them play, they did answer to me from a talent standpoint. Are they, you know, capable? And they are. I'll tell you the game I'm looking forward to is TCU and West Virginia. Yeah, that one's a really interesting game because they're so dramatically different in the way Dana Holgerson calls a game and the yeah. way TCU does things. I really think, you know, Gary has under Gary understands that in the Big Twelve, even though he's a defensive coach and he has said it time and again, you've got to hold these teams to field goals. And I think with their offense. The way they like to, I think the thing that's going to change for TCU, and unlike years past where they controlled the clock so much of the ground game, I think they're going to have to throw the ball around way more than he's done in the past. It's going to be interesting, I'll tell you. That's what makes it fun, though, because like I said, there's a lot of still unanswered questions out there college football-wise, so I love college football for that very reason. Good stuff. Yeah, and I love it because uh, for what I saw Saturday, I mean, the element of the screw-up <laughs> it's so prominent in college games because you know there are a bunch of twenty year olds running around. So I love watching that, and I'm and because no one has played anybody yet, really. Yeah, I'm fascinated to see how this develops, especially in the Big Twelve here in the next couple of months. The one thing I do know is Alabama could beat the Cowboys. That's the only thing I'm going to say. Okay, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> All right, hey Mac, great talking to you, buddy. We love reading your stuff, and thanks for coming on. We'll talk to you next Monday. Okay, anytime, Brian. Right, Thank buddy. you. Mac Engel from the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, the Big Mac blog, and, of course, you can catch his work on DFWOT, the uh, iTablet magazine as well, on Brian Houston Sports Radio Live on 99.3 Talk FM.